So I repeat, our hymn today is, is Crown Him with Many Crowns. We're going to sing it first and then talk through it. There's a lot of theology in this one, so we'll take a little bit while to work through. Let's go. Instead of the bum bum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum, it'd be crown him with many, crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon the throne. It wouldn't have the this the swung beat. The what beat? Swung beat. Theology. Crown him with many crowns. This is a fun hymn that developed over many stages. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Reference to anyone? Book of the Bible? Uh, Say it louder, with confidence. Revelation, yeah. Revelation chapter 5, 6, where the lamb shows up. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Again, a Reference to Revelation. You have, if you notice, particularly from about 1800 through 1950, a lot of hymns were taken from that section of text. Revelation 5 and 6, the heavenly scene where the Lamb shows up and all of heaven is singing praises and glory to God. Uh, lots of hymns reflect, come from that text. Was it because they were, like, looking for the end of time? Yeah. Like, that's like... There was, there was a, it was, there was a revived... 
uh, emphasis on the gospel and the end times in particular, the resurrection that we're looking for. So that's what we're looking at. Uh, Awake, my soul, and sing of him who died for thee, and hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Translation. Jesus will reign forever and ever. And what am I going to do about it? I'm going to praise him. I'm going to sing, yeah. I will praise. I will praise. Crown him the Lord of life who triumphed o'er the grave. So notice the, the crown here. Crown him with many crowns. This is like the introduction. Okay. Uh, the lamb upon his throne, so we're getting the image of a king. And now we're going to start listening to the crown. So what are we crowning him as? The Lord of Life. Mm-hmm. Lord of Life meaning what? He triumphed over the grave. He defeated death. He triumphed over the grave, yeah. And rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save. Describing the resurrection. He saved us from death. His glories now we sing who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring and lives that death may die. I love that, that line. Who died eternal life to bring and lives the death may die. Nice and good. God bless you. I'm saying very God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anticlimactic. Uh, great, great line expressing traditional Orthodox Christianity. Yeah? Died eternal life to bring and lives the death may die. It's like, that's the gospel. Yes, good. Crown him, what are we crowning him now? Lord of Peace. Lord of Peace. Whose power a scepter sways. Man, get it out. Whose power a scepter sways, what's that mean? Translation? He's the king who has all power. Power to do what? To sway other kings. There you go, to cease wars, to bring peace. Lord of I was Peace. Say, oh. Defeat death, but that too—that was the last verse. Yeah. <sighs> Come on, get it out, get it out. Look at something. Look at a bright light. That'll make you sneeze. Look Seriously. At that light. Seriously, I'm, I'm not, not joking. I'm gonna keep I'm really stopping mid sneeze. From pole to pole, that wars may cease, and all be prayer and praise. Pole to pole. North pole to south pole. North pole to south pole. And then that, the I'm whole earth. The that wars may cease. <laughs> oh my she said, "Let's <laughs> His reign shall know no end, and round his pierced feet, fair flowers of paradise extend their fragrance, fragrance ever sweet. What are we describing? Heaven. Heaven, more specifically, the not heaven. in metaphorical Eden? terms. No. Okay. Heaven reigns not in earth. Look at the light, look at the light. Nathan, please. I hate sneezing. Why? That's why I'm trying not to laugh, because I do too. I hate that laugh. What are we what are we describing? Remember you go ahead and toot my own horn. Remember my sermon in Riggins? Is it, no. is it New Jerusalem? Yeah, New, either New Jerusalem or or uh, Millennial Kingdom, one of those two. Uh, but yeah, New Jerusalem. It, it'll be heaven, but only because God's there. Uh, it'll be on earth. Uh, good, crown him the Lord of Love. So how are we going to describe this particular crowning? Well, remember his, his hands and his side? Pierced his hands and... Yeah. His okay. sacrifice. Those wounds yet visible above in beauty glorified. I, again, I love that. Very, very good poetry. <laughs> right? Yet visible above in beauty glorified. What's that saying? What's, what's this say? Those wounds yet visible above in beauty glorified. What statement is he making about the wounds? Uh, that they're still visible now. They're still visible now. Like, like we saw Jesus post-resurrection and he had the wounds, right? Like, like the lamb that was uh, that looked like it, it had been slain. God accepted his sacrifice. Right. That opens the scroll in Revelation. And so up in, in glory, they're not... Uh, they're not gruesome. They're beautiful. They are a reminder of the sacrifice of the love. Yeah. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for thou hast died for me. Thy praise and glory shall not fail throughout eternity. Translation. You died for me. Praise and glory for eternity. There you go. 
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Uh, no, I think so. Back to college? Yeah, we can one thing What? Oh my gosh, where did that start? Leah, your child. I started something. I'm so proud of myself. I'm proud of the world. Steven was kind of doing it, just not as dramatic. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know. Blame Steven. For the next, for the next title, sure. make it justified. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> Matthew Bridges was a member of the Oxford movement, movement, often called Tractarians, after following the lead of John Henry Newman. Tractarians were those within the Anglican Church who wanted to see a move within the church body to incorporate more of the traditional Roman Catholic liturgy in their services. Many Tractarians eventually converted entirely to Roman Catholicism as a result. Bridges was one such Tractarian. Bridges was born in Essex, England in 1800 and left the Church of England to become Roman Catholic in 1848, just three years after John Henry Newman had taken that course. He published two small volumes of hymns, Hymns of the Heart and The Passion of Jesus. Crown Him with Many Crowns was published in the second edition of Hymns of the Heart in 1851 in six eight-line stanzas. Notice we only sang four. If there was ever a hymn that suited Christ the King Sunday, last Sunday before Advent begins in New Christ, a new Christian year, according to the Roman calendar, it is this hymn. The original six stanzas mention six crowns. Crown him the Lamb upon the throne, drawn from Revelation 22.1. Crown him the Virgin's Son. Crown him the Son of God. Crown him the Lord of Love. Crown him the Lord of Peace. Crown him the Lord of Years. Hymnology scholar J.R. Watson notes, that during the 1870s, objections were made to Bridges' words, perhaps because of the complex references to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Godfrey III, 1823 to 1903, an Anglican priest, composed a new version and published it in his Hymns and Sacred Lyrics. The United Methodist hymnal, like many others in the Protestant Church, combines a stanza of Thring's text, stanza two, with three from Bridges' original. A good or even a great text does not survive without a stirring tune. Diademata, meaning crowns, is the tune that was written by Sir George Job Elvi. Elvi, there we go. For this hymn, when it was published in the appendix of Hymns Ancient and Modern, in 1868, Watson agrees that which, with what most when he observes, the tune makes a magnificent setting for the text, march-like and joyful, without ever becoming mechanical or strident. Bridges lived his senior years in Canada and died in Quebec on 6th of October, 1894, at the age of 94. So that's why Denise knew it, because it's because it came a Catholic hymn. Because it came the same time that she was born. Yeah. Yes. Well, so, I can um, give you a little hint that's on in here. Oh, Not that it's that big of a but John Henry Newman, mm -hmm. um, on university campuses, um, if there's a Catholic organization or a building for the Catholics, it's always called the Newman Center. Hmm. I didn't know that. And I imagine that that's the Newman that they're talking about. Uh, he was a pretty major, major Catholic leader. Uh, having deconverted from the Anglican Church. No. No. You hurt somebody or yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Who's is this? Is this yours? No. Can I use it? Because yeah. yeah. I don't want to ask someone that staple. Who should have told her? No, I'm saying I didn't want to eat that. Like, no, I'm saying I didn't want to eat that. You're trying to stay staple on the All right. Mm. You are. Four to one. Thank you. Today we are continuing <laughs> apologetics. That's a nice font. Thanks. What is that? Well, I, no, I did not. I downloaded it. Today we are studying the reliability of the Bible. Sorry? You download the font? Yep. Fonts are fun. They make yeah. everything more fun. You can download tons of fonts. You can make your own font. I did it with my font symbols. It's a lot harder to create your own font than you would think. I've tried to make one of my own handwriting. To make it actually like a usable oh, font that you can type in is a lot more difficult than I thought. Yeah. So today we're talking about the reliability of the Bible. Most. So real quick recap. What did we talk about last week? Anybody remember? Apologetics. Oh my gosh. Uh, I'm wrong. Precept. Listen. Listen. 
versus uh, Mr. T. Evidentialism. Versus evidentialism, yeah. Presuppositionalism versus evidentialism. We did talk a lot about that. What's kind of the basic point of presuppositionalism? Presuppositionalism is, is accepting the Bible as true. It's like a lot like Okay. And counting as a starting point with fitting. And saying okay. that you have no common ground. Yeah. Yeah, and saying that you have no common common ground with the atheist. That the atheist is not actually an atheist if the Bible is true. Uh, all right, good, yeah. Those are the basics of presuppositionalism. So where most apologists being evidentialists, will, they will start with the existence of God. They'll say, we, we're going to start on the same common ground as the atheist, all we have in common is reason, and so they're going to try and reason that God exists, and from reasoning that God exists, they'll reason that Jesus is the Son of God, and from reasoning that Jesus is the Son of God, they'll reason that the Bible is reliable and true, because Jesus used the Bible. The presuppositionalist says, no, the Bible is true, and so we're going to start with showing that the Bible is true. Because there are no true atheists. Because there are no true atheists, yeah. Could you still start with the Bible and still be an evidentialist? Uh, not usually. You'd probably be a, a cumulative case evidentialist or... Oh my gosh, uh, don't make things... There's a whole bunch of subgroups. <laughs> uh, Let's go with all of them. Pro yeah, pro you probably wouldn't... If, if you're going to do that... Uh, you'd, you'd probably end up being a somebody who does not identify with either of the two major camps, and you'd be a cumulative case approach apologist. So kind of sharing some from the <laughs> presuppositionalist, some from the ridiculous. So since I've come around to the presuppositional approach to apologetics, I start with the Bible. Um, and to begin with, instead of looking at the external evidence, that's what we're going to look at last, which is where most people tend to hang out when they're talking about the reliability of the Bible. We're going to talk about the, the point of the Bible, their bibliology straight, and look at the internal evidence uh, for the Bible as reliable. To begin with, though, uh, so we're going to take three or four minutes and watch a segment of an Andy Stanley sermon. Uh, you might remember this about a year ago now. Andy Stanley was was in hot water with many people because of this sermon series. And so we're going to watch one short segment of it uh, that has a couple of quotes that he got in, in big hot water with. Uh, and so it's just kind of get your mind jogging a little bit about the Bible, about its reliability, about what it is for the Christian. Okay? And hopefully this will work well with our technology misbehaving uh, lately. That's about right. Okay. Is that him? Yeah, that's Andy Stanley. You want it? It'll be you about three minutes. Give him the line. So real quick to let you know, uh, this is part three of a sermon series that he's doing. He uh, essentially want his his goal with this sermon series was to appeal to the atheists in his congregation and try and give them a a, a, a reason to reconsider Christianity. So to begin with, does that strike your ears as strange? What's kind of the issue there? You're assuming you have atheists in your... Yeah, <laughs> the fact that he's actually designing a sermon series for the atheists in his congregation... That's a minority. It ...means that his ecclesiology, his view of the church, is a little it's bit poor. And actually, I, so I watched all of these sermon series, and that's really his big problem, is his ecclesiology. He doesn't understand what the church is, which leads into... a an interesting bibliology. You know, wait, quite understand. Wait, say Bibles. that he doesn't understand what the church is. Yeah. Like the purpose of the church. Yeah, the purpose of the church, particularly the purpose of the local church, but the purpose of the universal church. Because I know uh, a pastor who um, doesn't know even. Um, yeah. I'm shutting up. Uh, <laughs> so he's in the middle of the series. So he, the first two sermons were basically like, if you're an atheist, I want to invite you to think with me and 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 reconsider Christianity from a more intellectual basis. He's doing apologetics in this whole sermon series, basically. And so he's, he's introducing his view of the Bible and sort of explaining uh, why he thinks a lot of people walk away from Christianity when they grew up in it. 
and that's what we're going to watch. We shouldn't be done on Sunday. It should be done on your own time. And the conversation really begins like this. Many of you, you're like me, many of you were brought up to believe this. Jesus loves me. <laughs> this I know. Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a fabulous song. Most of our kids are still singing this song. We sang this song. Jesus loves me. This I know. What's the next line? Right. For the Bible tells me so. And this is where our trouble began. It really did. This is where our trouble began because, and don't leave, because the implication is, the implication is, this is important, the implication is the Bible is the reason we believe. The Bible is the reason to believe. In other words, I can believe Jesus loves me because it's in the Bible. I grew up in a church where basically the byline, the subtitle for everything was, if the Bible says it, that, anybody, settles it right here on the front row. Yeah, that's right. If the Bible says it, that settles it. And so we send kids off to college with a, if the Bible says it, that settles it. And oh my goodness, they discovered that that didn't settle it. And then they come home and they say, Mom, Dad, Grandma, my Granddad, Uncle, Aunt, did you know, did you know? It's like, oh, I don't ask those questions. The Bible says it, that settles it. The Bible says it, that settles it. The problem is this. The problem with that is this. If the Bible is the foundation of our faith, if the Bible is the foundation of our faith, as the Bible goes, so goes our faith. Okay, pause there and talk a little bit. Uh, what's the issue that he's that he's outlining? <laughs> the Bible isn't real. <laughs> yeah, well, that's kind of the conclusion he unintentionally gets to, and he would deny that. Uh, the the problem or the issue that he's that he's noticing is is people and the the diagnosis is is actually correct to a certain extent that. People have an immature faith, and they do not question what they believe. They simply accept it as fact. Without, gospel? Yeah, as gospel. Without, without thinking through why it is so. And so he's talking about a, a lot of people, and I'm sure you know them, who, who just have this very simplistic, look, the Bible says it, I believe it, period, kind of faith, without thinking through why does the Bible say it, and even thinking through why do I believe the Bible. That's a fair question. Why, why do I believe the Bible? That's how he should have gone about, about uh, presenting this. Instead, he's identifying with the atheists in the room and saying, look, yeah, I, I know where you're coming from. Uh, I grew up with these people who were just so stupid, and they said, you know, the Bible says that that settles it. And then, I, like, I, grew, I was growing up, and I'm sure you grew up, where like, people you went, met in, in college, in high school, and they were coming home with all these ideas that would seem to suggest that the Bible isn't reliable and it isn't true, and so you just abandon the faith. And since your faith was built on the Bible instead of on something else, uh, it, your faith crumbled. And the problem, I'm going to give you a tip off so you can hear it when it comes, is that he accepts as a source of truth the secular school, the scientists, etc., without questioning them the same way that he questions the Bible. I'm saying apply the same standard. I, that's what I would say. Look, question all of your sources of truth, identify what the truth claims are, and evaluate them. See if they are valid. And so we're going to look at some of the truth claims throughout this whole thing. But that's where he's going to go, and I want you to hear it when he says it. In other words, Christianity cannot survive if the Bible goes away. Christianity cannot survive if somehow every single part of the Bible isn't absolutely true if the Bible is the foundation of our faith. If the Bible is the foundation of our faith, it is all or nothing. If anything proves that something in the Bible isn't actually, absolutely, historically, or scientifically reliable, uh-oh, the whole thing comes tumbling down because this version of Christianity is a house of cards. And all you have to do is pull out one card and the whole thing comes tumbling down. Christianity becomes a fragile house of cards that comes tumbling down when people point out apparent contradictions in the Bible. When in school we're told there's no way the earth is 6,000 years old, it's 4.5 or 4.55 billion years old, and the universe is 14.5 billion years old, and all of a sudden all we have to do, you know, the, the tension is around, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, but science has said, science has said, the Bible says, science has said, the Bible says, and then all of a sudden there's this extraordinary, extraordinary tension. If the Bible, if the Bible, if the bi entire Bible isn't true, then let's be honest. The Bible isn't true. See, the, the thing he's pointing out, and he's saying it poorly. He's honestly not a great communicator, in my opinion. I kind of know, I know his wife. I was in classes with her, and he went to the same seminary as me. Uh, 
he's saying he thinks that a a bad view of Christianity is one that says the Bible is a, is an inerrant source of truth, and building your faith on what the Bible says is unhelpful. He says. I think that's bull, but that's that's what he said. Uh, and he's saying, look, if that's the reality, then the entire Bible has to be true. And if one point can be shown to be false, then your, your faith is in vain. And I'm saying, yeah, <laughs> that, that's exactly right. He's saying that's a bad thing. Look, if somebody, if somebody can come up and prove to you that, that uh, he's about to say, the, the tower of the walls of Jericho <coughs> didn't fall, then your faith is in vain. The Bible's shown to be false, and you don't have, you don't have a rock-solid foundation for your faith. I actually agree. If someone could prove that, he would be correct. The problem is nobody has. He seems to think that some have. So, so question, yeah. real quick. Okay, so I can't remember where I heard this, but a long time ago when I was a baby Christian, um, it kind of stuck with me that a lot of people will say, well, the Bible says blah, 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 mm -hmm. when we really should be saying and putting it more in our thoughts that God says in the Bible, because it's God's Word, and so that focuses more on God and on Him and our relationship with Him. Right. Our faith is based on Him and what He says, not a book. I would, not. I would give an amen to that, and I would further add two things. One, when you, whenever you say the Bible says, follow that up with where does the Bible say, and how does the Bible say it? Because there are a lot of things that the people say the Bible says that it doesn't. And if you quote a verse out of context, you can get the Bible to say a whole lot of things that it doesn't say. Which again feeds into this, what he's correctly identifying as a, as a bad version of Christian faith, which is very immature, does not question itself, does not strengthen itself. Uh, it just accepts as fact for no other reason than somebody else told me to. Yeah, question? Or are you just... No, I'm just going to have a drawer. Keep listening, he's going to say a couple things that... I mean, if the whole thing isn't true, because you grew up, and I grew up, if you grew up in a church, in, in the United States, it's basically, the Bible says it, that settles it. The Bible says it, that settles it. And then we grow up. We I'm become adults. That, we become aware of things that make yeah. us wonder if everything in the Bible is true. And when we conclude, or if we come to the conclusion that maybe it's not all as true as we were told it was true, Christianity comes tumbling down. This Did you hear that? If may, when we conclude, if we conclude that it's not as true as we were told it was, again, kind of right, kind of wrong. Uh, sh some things that you're told the Bible says, and you don't ask where does it say it and how does it say it, you might be right to disregard those things because the Bible doesn't actually say it. You have to do the work. But true yeah, is right. true. There's no partial truth. Correct. And that's that's why, he's, again, he's saying it very poorly. It's either the Bible says it and it's true, or the Bible doesn't actually say it and people think that it does. Oh. So it's not true. So it's not true. But then or at least really it's not necessarily true. It this might be true, like, it might not. There are true things like that the Bible doesn't say. Borean. 2 plus 2 is 4, and nowhere will you find that in the Bible. But This is just the Borean problem. Exactly. This puts the Bible in a place that if we can't defend everything in it, everything in it goes away. And the good news is that that's very unfortunate. And the great news is that is absolutely unnecessary. That's where I wanted to end it. He goes on and... Uh, I would encourage you to go watch the whole series. He says a lot of things that I think are just egregious. Uh, and a lot of things that are just extremely poorly communicated. And most of it stems from a poor ecclesiology. Most of it stems from not understanding who's in his church and what the church is supposed to be doing. And so he fashions his messages to appeal to the atheists in his congregation, which just blows my mind. But, uh, anyway. Uh, it was a big controversy, and then it kind of died down. Uh, when was this? Uh, about a year ago, 2017. Okay. 20... July 17, 2018. No, uh, it was a lot longer ago than that. Uh, that's just when they posted it. If you go to, if you Google "Who Needs God," Andy Stanley, you'll find the the sermon series. So the first thing we got to do is, is get our bibliology straight. What is the Bible? What does it say? How is it saying it? We can get the lights back on. Yes. 
Thanks. And here's my long-winded uh, statement of what the Bible is. And you have it on your papers. This from me. The Bible is a story about God and how he governs and interacts with man. It is making one major argument throughout this story. God is good and created humans good, but they became sinful and selfish, incurred on themselves the punishment of death. They cannot save themselves from that punishment. This story details God and God's way of resolving that problem. Basically, what are you supposed to get out of this book? What does this book tell you that no other book can? The resolution to the problem. And about the guy who created everything. This tells you about God, and it tells you about how he's fixing the problem of death. Those are the two things that this book can tell you that no other book can. There are a lot of, th and this is, gets back to my, my problem with applicational preaching and, and the idea that every single passage needs to be applied to your life in some specific way. And then we go and read about uh, David in the wilderness and we draw some application about, uh, about running away from God or something. No. No. It's telling one story... <laughs> We, we we read about David and Goliath, and we and you know Goliath. No. We're we're looking we're looking for like how how to face your giants, and the point is that you're supposed to you're supposed to be brave. It's like no, there are other stories that can teach you to be brave. This story is doing one thing. It's telling you about God about saving it. What? The way you said that. No. 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 It's so common, even among really strong conservative Christians. And it just bugs me. There's a lot of books out there that can teach you good moral truth. Aesop's fables are great. There's a lot of things that can... that Other places you can find that. There's only one place you can find out about God, about how he's solving the problem of death, and that's this book. It's one story making that major point throughout. Which is why I highlight details God and God's way of resolving the problem, namely, how does he resolve it? We've seen the end of the story. We've read the whole book. His son, he sends his son to pay the penalty of death and bestow eternal life on those who have faith in him to do so. So that's what the Bible is. So in truth. Views that say uh, the Bible is a collection of moral stories. No. Views that say that the Bible is, is the source of all truth. No. Like I said earlier, 2 plus 2 is 4. And nowhere in the Bible will you find that. How do you deal with that? Well, the Bible is not the source of all truth. It's the source of two particular truths. Okay? And that, again, shakes a lot of people sometimes who grew up in the, the Bible says, kind of milieu because, you know, the idea that that the Bible doesn't answer every single question I might have is frightening when you've been brought up thinking that the Bible answers every question that you have. You see where I'm going with this? At least you're tracking with me so far. So I want to think about this story, this story that's making two major points, telling you about God and telling you about how he's saving humanity from death. Uh, some facts about it so we get a better view of it. First of all, it contains many genres. So, just like many books, uh, Lord of the Rings comes to mind for me, because there's a lot of songs in Lord of the Rings. If you're reading, you get to Tom Bombadil, and it's like every other page is like a list of songs and lyrics, and you're reading through these lyrics, and you have no idea what the tune is. So you're just like reading poetry, kind of. Right? Uh, stories can contain other genres within them, and the Bible is that way. It's a story that contains lots of other genres. It has narrative, it has poetry, it has proverbs, it has songs. It has census data, it has genealogical records, it has legal documents, and it has letters. What are the legal documents? Uh, Deuteronomy as a whole is one big legal document. Um, the yeah, Levitical, law. The Levitical law. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's quite a variety of genre. You have to read the story and recognize what genre it is as you're reading it. If you're reading Lord of the... Have you guys read the Lord of the Rings? Does that... Illustration yeah, makes sense to you. Amazing. So much better ago. than the books. A long time. When you, when you get to Tom Bombadil and you start reading Wait, the songs. Oh, that's so much better than the books. No, um, the books are much better than the books. That's <laughs> I know. Like, I know. What? I said it it's so there. much better than the books. <laughs> the books? Those are just way better. And people have just seen the movies. I'm talking about Tom Bombadil, the, Tom yeah, Bombadil and they're like, who? I know. That's one of the reasons why the books one of, are better. One of the most annoying characters, in my opinion. Tom Bombadil. I know, but he's... Yeah. He's yeah. great. He's a great character. Yeah. 
if you but if you get to him and he starts singing and you keep reading it as if it's part of the narrative that's advancing the plot along, you're going to be confused. Okay, you have to recognize. Okay, this is a song that he's singing in the midst of a narrative. Same. Everybody with me on genres? Yeah. <laughs> it spans all of human history. It it claims to 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 span all of human history from the creation of the universe until eternity. That's everything. If, unless I'm is, if, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> from the creation of everything to the eternity of everything, that's everything. That's that's the time frame that it that it claims to span. So, uh, one, that means we're in it right now because we're not yet at eternity. So somewhere, the, the the storytelling catches up to the present time and continues past it. That's unique. Not many books do that and claim to be true which we're about to get to in a second. Uh, it also, you need to recognize that the full story, this is more just from, from us as we're looking at the Bible, the full story from conflict to resolution is not witnessed by a single human at all. In fact, billions of humans literally live and die and see a very small sliver of the full progression of the story. I would even maybe even say millions of billions of humans live and die and only see a single sliver of the story. That's important to know. Particularly if you're coming from an evidentialist approach, and you're saying, I'm going to try and observe the world around me to understand truth and everything. Uh, this story cannot be, the, the message of the Bible cannot be ascertained from looking at the world around you by anyone. You have to read it. That's, that's, like, that's the only way you're going to get the whole story. And that's also where you have to have faith. And that's also where, where faith comes in, yeah. Um, everybody with me on those two points surrounding the fact that it spans all of human history. All right. It claims to be true. That's another thing. This is a funny little comic I found. By now you should feel the effects of the truth serum coursing through your veins. Now you will tell us what we want to know. Have you been flossing? <laughs> <laughs> Because everybody lies to the dentist when he asks if you've been flossing. I just but. say a super general statement. It's not technically wrong. I usually just say not as much as I should, but just which doesn't say that I'm not, but also... <laughs> which means that you're not. <laughs> not always. Because it's less than I should. Zero is much less than I should. <laughs> uh, but she didn't use the term much. Yeah. If you floss at least once before you go to the dentist, you're good. <laughs> the Bible claims of itself to be true. And so you, again, as the thinker, have to ask yourself, in what sense does it claim to be true? Philosophically, there should be a question mark. Morally, historically, scientifically? In what sense are we talking about the truth of the Bible? So, let's hear some thoughts. What do you think? In what sense does the Bible claim to be true? Yes, definitely historically. Historically. I would say, yeah, it claims to be true historically. There are times all throughout the Bible where it records historical data, and it seems to be just recording historical data. Is it a clue that you don't have a question after morally? No, it's just a typo. Okay. Morally? I'd say, yeah, it, it claims to be true morally. It t claims to be, to be explaining the, what is wrong with humanity and how it intends to be fixed. So it claims to be making truths about the moral status of, of humanity as a whole, for sure. Philosophically? Yes. Sort of. What's, what does philo philosophy mean? They just got out of philosophy class. They should have gone over. They come from yeah. Greek word. It's, well, it's, it's uh, kind of like thinking about thinking. Thinking about thinking close. Philos? So, so is it Greek or Latin that means like philo is love? It's Greek. Yeah, so philo, okay. phileo, or philos is love. Sophos, this means wisdom. Love of wisdom is what philosophy means. Loving what is wise. That's, that's what the study of philosophy is. is. Trying to learn wisdom. What is wisdom? Kind fear of, of the Lord. Kind of, fear of the Lord. The Bible claims 
claims that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. So yeah, it claims to be true philosoph philosophically. Uh, Wisdom, I, I think the simplest definition of wisdom is applied knowledge. It's not just knowing something, it's knowing how something works in the real world. Depends, not Here's a, a, a big one that's got to, what about scientifically? What does it really state? So yeah, it depends on when it's speaking on what. So, big one in the apologetic world, what about Genesis 1 and 2, the creation of the world? Is it claiming to give a scientific account of how the world was created or not? No. It's a historical, it's a historical account. Historical account. Okay, good. What's the difference between a historical account and a scientific account? Scientific is using the stuff we have around us right now to come to a, uh, to come to a resolution. One more time, say that in a different way, so I'm understanding you. It's using the things that we have now to yeah, come science, to a conclusion. Science is using evidence. Historical is just saying it happened. With science, you, you need to be able to use the scientific method. Okay. What's the scientific method? That it has to be reproducible, it has to be, I don't know, Sam, I'm going to remember. Observable, testable, repeatable? Yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, history is, is recording a story that occurred on planet Earth. Science literally comes from, from the word to know. Um, and science is trying to, trying to show how the world currently works. Observable, observable testable, repeatable. As you mentioned, it's, it's evidence-based, and in particular, it's observable, testable, repeatable evidence. It's not historical evidence. That would be a different field of study. Uh, history would still be evidence-based, but it's just what kind of evidence are you using. Science is, is trying to figure out how the world currently works. It's saying, I took this thing and this thing, and they did this other thing. And I did it over and over and over again, and I observed the same result each time. That means that whenever this thing touches this thing, this thing happens. Every time. Every time. Observable, testable, repeatable. Okay, the test, you observed it, you repeated it over and over again, and the results were the same. That's how science works. It's not a knock on science. It's just saying, that's what it does. It observes the world around it as it is. It is not observing the world around it as it was. Yeah. So, by that definition, isn't it also, um, like, the whole idea that science uses about the Big Bang Theory, mm -hmm. that cannot be reproducible. Is, is not cannot, scientific. Right. And yet a lot of the science community uses that <coughs> as their creation story. Correct. But yeah. it's not scientific. There's a whole lot of things that we ascribe the term science to nowadays that I would argue are not actually science. Right. They are study of history. Or even in this case, it's not even history, but it's not a story written down. I mean, it's... it's right. It's, 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 it's the study of things that have happened, not the things study of things that are happening. Uh, and when you're studying things that have happened, there's a certain methodology that you use, and it's different than the methodology that you use for science. Again, it's not a knock on science. It's just the science does one thing, history does another. Uh, I mean, they should say it's theory. Just like Darwin is a theory. It's not fact. Yeah. Same thing with, like, the Big Bang. Yeah. It's a theory. Same with uh, global warming, um, climate change, science. Mm -hmm. the, the term nowadays, in particularly political cir circles, is science deniers. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, like it's, it's, uh, it's conclusion of scientists deniers. The way that we've come up with the idea that the that the Earth is warming at a faster rate than than previous millennia is assuming that the Earth has always had a particular constant climate and pattern of of freezing and cooling, and observing ice core samples that supposedly go back millions of years. Well, it's built on a couple of assumptions that you get that ice core sample, and if those assumptions are false, then your conclusions are false. And so, how do you deny? How do you Prove the assumptions. Well, you can't. You have to accept them. They're presuppositions. 
So there's a lot of things. When you start actually looking at the evidence presented and the, the way that a scientist comes about his conclusion is not necessarily scientific. It depends on how he got there. Humans are fallible. It can't be proven it's true, but it can't be proven it's not true. Exactly. I mean, it's... It's a historical thing. Most things that are in the realm of science, I'm getting a little bit off track, but most things that are the realm of science that I would d deny as a Bible-believing Christian, I'm not denying because the Bible says it. I'm denying because the, the methodology, I think, is faulty. It's built on the faulty assumption that the earth is now as it always has been. Or rather, the earth always has been the way that it is now. There's a lot of things that science claims, most notably the age of the earth, that is built upon the assumption that the systems currently in place in the earth, the way that rain falls, the way that uh, the climate heats and cools and seasons, uh, these things are constant and have been constant from the beginning of the earth. The, uh -huh. the way there's six billion people, eight billion, whatever. I'm not sure if I... The, it's built on the assumption that, that the current systems of the earth are, have always been the same. And if the Bible's true, then they haven't. The Bible specifically says, in at least two places, that the systems of the earth changed radically. One easy one that everybody knows is, in those days, rain did not fall on the earth. Instead, a mist rose up from the ground and watered the face of the earth. You guys remember that at the beginning of the story of Noah? Okay. The Bible specifically says that the systems of the earth were different prior to the flood than after. Which means the conclusion that you build based around the idea that rain has always falled and frozen and heated up and cooled at the same time and you take the ice core sample and you trace it back, if the Bible's true, that's built on a bad assumption. It's a fault in logic. It's a fallacy. The, the fallacy of assumed constant is what it's called. Uh, and I'm getting way off track, but that's why I deny a lot of things that I deny. Not because the Bible says so, so much as it's built on a fallacy. And I don't like building my truth claims on fallacies. I like building my truth claims on facts. Yeah. Anyway, we're clear on what the Bible is. Last, last bit that I didn't include in the slide, but I wanted to make sure we got, uh, was recognizing how the Bible came together. Oh, yeah, we studied that a little bit in church history, didn't we? We did. And uh, there'll be a little bit more of it afterward. But one of the things, again, if you, if you do go watch all of Andy Stanley's sermons, he makes a lot of points about the idea that early Christians didn't have the whole Bible. From, from year zero to year 300, they didn't have this thing called the Bible, where they could build their, their truth claims off of the text. Instead, they had the experience of seeing the resurrected Jesus. And so they built their faith off of that. And he's half right and half wrong. They did have the scriptures. They called them the scriptures. What were they? Anyone? The letters. The Torah. The Torah, for sure. The first, the first five books of Moses. Five. Likely, all of the early Christians had access to, in their local synagogues, all the prophets. Genesis Ooh. through Malachi. Mm -hmm. They had, along with some other uh, apocryphal books. They had what they termed the scriptures. They did have a Bible. It was called the Hebrew Bible. It was not the 66 books that we have today, but... It was the scriptures. They were building their faith on a written, revealed word from God. And that's, again, one of Andy Stanley's fallacies that he, that he builds off of. They also had the written letters. The early church had the letters that were in the New Testament. They just were not canonized yet. They were not officially deemed part of scripture by a council of the church. That does not mean that the early Christians didn't recognize that they were true letters inspired by the Holy Spirit and should be treated as Scripture. In fact, there's a couple places in Scripture that seem to indicate that they did understand exactly that. But we'll look at them in just a second. Internal evidence. So, we're looking at, is the Bible a reliable place, a reliable source of truth? And what kinds of truth? And these are the places in Scriptures where it claims of itself that it is telling the truth and where it is reliable. And there's more than this, but these are the ones I picked out for us to actually look at. Uh, 2 Timothy 3 is one that you probably know, at least verses 16 and 17, but we're going to start a little bit earlier, because context matters. Context matters. All scriptures matter. Yeah. That's 16, right? All scriptures die free. Yeah, 2 Timothy 3, 16 is one you probably already know. All scriptures got breathed. 
profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. But we're going to start at verse 13. He's, he mentions this to Timothy in the midst of talking about false teachers who are going to come. The context in which Paul instructs Timothy about this is key. Verse 13, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, you continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from who you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with what? I have the sacred writings here. Holy Scriptures. Holy Scriptures. Where is this? First, First, Second Timothy oh, 3, three. Yeah. Verse, verse 15. 15. Yeah. Which are able to make you what? Wise. Wise for salvation through faith in Christ. What does Paul say is the point of the Bible in verse 15? Wisdom that leads to salvation. Yeah. It's so that you'll learn the gospel. Remember the two things that the Bible does? Teaches you about God and the plan of salvation? Everybody quotes verse 16, and they don't get that that's an explanation or a further furthering of Paul's original statement, which is, what does the scriptures do? They make you wise unto salvation, able to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They preach the gospel. That's what the scriptures do. And he further explains, all scripture is God-breathed. Profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete or perfect or finished, what are we thinking of when we're talking about a man being complete and perfect and finished? Big R. Resurrected. Resurrection. Scripture is able to make you wise unto salvation, that you might reach resurrection, equipped for every good work, because there will be work in the new earth. Uh, so that's not, that's not talking about, like, now, every good work? I, I, don't. I mean, every is every. That could be now and later. That's true. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't split churches over it. No, uh, not at all. Yeah. That's a thing. I'm just always going. You got to read your verses in light of the context, and in the context, he specifically said right before it, "What does he think the point of scriptures are? Well, they're able to make you wise unto salvation." So the purpose and ability of Scripture, make you wise unto salvation, is able to equip you for that salvation. Turn you into the man that you should be, or the woman that you should be when you are resurrected. Uh, what about the source of Scripture? This kind of commented on the source of Scripture. What was the, what was the word that he used? Inspired. Inspired, God-breathed. Theopneustos. He... Uh, so the source of Scripture oh, okay. kind of was mentioned in Second Timothy 3.16 because all Scripture is God breathed, theos, neustos. He actually made up a compound word there. Theos, God, neustos, breath. Uh, that was Paul making up a word that nobody heard before. Uh, Exodus 31 and Second Peter 1.19 give us another kind of insight into the source of Scripture. Exodus 31, you know, 18, you don't have to look up. It's the, the verse that says, written with the finger of God. When he's, when he's given the law to Moses, right? And he picks up the tablets, tablets that were written with the finger of God. This is an actual photograph of that event. Nice. Wow. Whoa. 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 Second Peter 1.19. First <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Peter. Again, in the context of teaching about false teachers and what to do when false teachers come along, Second Peter is written mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and tells. The prophetic word is it's an altogether reliable thing. So he's saying uh, a whole, book, whole point of Second Peter is false teachers are going to come. They're going to try to deceive you. So how do we defend against that? Well, we know what we've seen. We we have our, our experience of seeing the resurrected Christ. And verse nineteen, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Jesus. 
knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So what's the source of Scripture? God. God. They spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now we can talk about what exactly that means. We know that ultimately what he's saying is it comes from God. It bears his authority. Whatever he's talking about is Scripture has God's authority behind it. Again, the point of this book is to tell you about God and the plan of salvation. God inspired the book. Uh, John 10. I suppose the, the enduring authority of Scripture. And I know we're jumping around a lot. I tend to not like jumping around so much, but we got to do it a little bit here. My apologies. John 10 is a wonderful passage that I highly encourage you to read. It's Jesus lecturing the Pharisees and the disciples about who he is. We start in verse... I want to start in 34. Yeah, it's just kind of like a, a byword. Uh, as in, for the, for the evidentialist who wants to argue from Jesus to the scriptures, you can do it that way. Because right here, Jesus recorded in the scriptures, says that the scriptures are authoritative and enduring. Uh, verse 34, Jesus answered them. They're about to stone him for, for what they think is blasphemy because he's made himself like God. Because he is God. At least according to the scriptures. Okay. Sorry, my presuppositionism seeping through. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came... And scripture cannot be broken. Do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said I am the Son of God? That little aside is, is the point here. Jesus seems to build an argument on the fact that the scripture cannot be broken. As in, the scriptures have, as I would put it, enduring authority. Right? Whatever authority the scriptures have, which is the, the word of God, the power of God behind them, they endure in their authority. Now, you have to read the whole scripture, the whole story, and find out which ones keep standing at the end of the story, and which ones are standing at your point in the story. You with me? Did that make sense? Kind of? Okay. So far, all of these, though, have been talking, as far as we know, about the Old Testament, right? Because they're writing about the scriptures, and when they're writing, they're talking about Genesis through Malachi. Hebrew Bible. Yeah, Hebrew Bible. Scriptures. However, 2 Peter 3.15, so back over to 2 Peter. So even, even the... Yeah. 2 Peter 3.15, this is as Peter is wrapping up his book. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do with the other scriptures. The word other is important there. You see the equation that Peter is implicitly making there? So he's saying, I want you to listen to this, just as Paul told you to listen to this in his letters. And there are people who try to twist the other scriptures just like they twist Paul's letters. What's he putting Paul's letters on an equal footing with? The other scriptures. scriptures. Right? The other scriptures, he's saying Paul's letters are on par with scripture. They are. Which means Old scriptures. Testament? Yes, Old Testament. Okay. Hebrew Bible. Hebrew Bible. Okay. So Peter is arguing in Second Peter that Paul's letters have the authority of Scripture. You see how we get there from that verse? Right. He's saying that the source is the same. They come from the wisdom of, of God, which earlier in this letter he talked about where Scriptures come from, men as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And he's saying Paul is writing under the wisdom given to him by the Holy Spirit. And he's placing the letters that he wrote on the same level as Scripture as far as their authority. 
So we have internal evidence from the Bible that claims that at least the New Testament writings of Paul are Scripture. With me? You know how we build that case? And then we've got the testimony of Scripture. Uh, this is something I've been hammering into you guys from the beginning. So you know, basically, this boils down to when Jesus says that all Scriptures are about Him, He means all the Scriptures are about Him. <laughs> Two different times. When he's talking about uh, on the road to Emmaus, and he talks to the guys, and he opens their eyes, and he instructs them through all the scriptures from, from Moses through the prophets that testified of him. He's saying, look, all this is pointing to me. This story is about me. Uh, he says the same thing in John 5. He's saying all scripture testifies about him, the coming of the Messiah. The point of the scripture is twofold, to tell the story of redemption and to tell about God. further internal evidence of the reliability of the Bible. So th these were all just to help you see what does the Bible claim about itself, right? What, is, what does the Bible say the Bible is? As far as looking at the Bible from a, from a trying to weigh the evidence standpoint, so this, this would be, these would be arguments that the evidentialists would get on board with too. Uh, fulfillment of Bible prophecy. 27% of scriptures is prophetic. 6,641 verses in the Old Testament, 1,711 verses in the New Testament are predictive in nature. They're trying to predict something that is going to happen in the future from when they were written. <clears throat> the chance of Jesus randomly fulfilling only 48 of these prophecies, of the prophecies made about him, is 1 in 10 to the power of 157. So basically, the simple way to think about this is if you think there's... What, there's set about 7,000 predictive verses. Let's assume all of them are about Jesus for the sake of argument. Uh, so if he fill, fulfills one of them, that's one in 7,000. If he fulfills two of them, that's one in 49,000. Right? Three of them, one in seven squared. And you see how that, that number compounds? So the idea of him fulfilling 48 of them is 10 in 157,000. I don't know why, when the people putting this together. I think it's uh, Josh McDowell in Evidence of the Man's Verdict. Uh, I don't know why he chose 48, probably just to make it sound impressive, because it is impressive. Uh, so the chance of him fulfilling 48 of them is 1 in 10 to the 157th power, so 1 with 157 zeros after it. 60 are clearly already fulfilled, at least. So just from a sheer statistics standpoint, the probability of things that were predicted about Jesus all throughout the Old Testament coming true in a literal sense is very, 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 very slim. Probably didn't happen by chance, is the point. It probably happened by God. Like the guy who wrote it said it was all going to happen and directs and ordains the, the events on the world. So this is a piece of evidence that is very appealing to the evidentialist who can look, turn to the atheist and say, look, uh, just by, by sheer statistical chance, the evidence is in favor of God preordaining and, and writing this down as opposed to it just happening. You've got to pay the second page of your handout was a list of uh, prophetic thing. It is not something I put together, so I take no credit or blame for it if it is not entirely accurate, but I did glance through it and it looked pretty solid. Uh, Why would you say credit if it's not entirely accurate? That's why I say I'm not taking credit or blame. Well, I understand the blame. Okay. So why the credit? I don't know. Everything good is to my credit, everything bad is not to my blame. <laughs> if it's so if there's credit to, be, to take, I'll gladly take it. And if it's, there's blame, it's your fault. It's all your fault. <laughs> I was quoting Parks and Rec. I assume you were doing a trial. No? It was okay. off the, the top. Oh, OK. Uh, external evidence. So that was all internal evidence. Things that the Bible says about the Bible. Right? Things that the Bible says within the Bible about the Bible. 
Now we're going to look externally. So how has the Bible interacted with the world? How has the Bible existed throughout history? Those sorts of things. The main external argument comes from recognizing the cumulative uniqueness of the Bible as compared to other books. So again, this is the, this is the approach that is very fav favorable to the evidentialists who are trying to prove that the Bible is reliable without using the Bible. I don't deny that these are, some of these are good arguments, which is why I include them here. I say that's not the starting point. The starting point is the Bible. Work out from it. Uh, when you recognize that the Bible is a supremely unique book, the divine act in producing such a work is more believable, like we just looked at with the predictive text, right? Which, it's, it's much more likely that someone ordained and organized it this way as opposed to it just randomly happening this way. So let's look at some of the unique things about the Bible compared to other books. First of all, it's unique in continuity. It was written over a hundred and excuse me, 1,500 years right. by the most liberal of estimates, as a, meaning the people who deny that it was written as old as I say it was written. 1,500 years at least. Written by more than 40 authors. Written in many different places, on three different continents, in three different languages, with a variety of writing styles. The idea that you could produce one coherent story that is, I would say, contradiction-free, but uh, some would argue with that, is quite unique. No other book has ever done that with this many different uh, criteria, right? You can't put, point to another book that has over 40 authors written over 1,500 years that still has one cohesive story throughout. doesn't exist. It's unique in its circulation. It's the number one book sold worldwide by a lot. More Bibles have been sold than any other book all throughout history, and it's not even close. Stolen or sold? Sold. Okay. Also sold. Stole. Sold uh, and sold. Second. Quotations from Chairman Mao Zedong. Yeah, I know, right? So. Thank you, Chinese population. <laughs> yeah. Over the last 50 years, the number of books printed and sold over the last 50 years, some titles may have had more copies printed than some of these books. But a vast number of those books were not sold. Uh, number one is the Holy Bible in the last 50 years, 3,900. Way down is Chinese propaganda, quotations from Chairman Mao Zedong. And then under that is Harry Potter. So, uh, again, the uniqueness, the fact that it has been circulated way more widely than any other book is notable. It's unique in its translation. Again, along with the circulation, it's been translated into 2,200 languages at least. The number has grown since this statistic. Uh, Wycliffe, in particular, has 6,000 people working on 850 languages as we speak. No other book has that kind of, of reach. Circulation and translation. It just doesn't exist. There's something unique about this book that makes people want to translate it and devote their lives to it. Circulating it. The most notable external evidence, though, is the uniqueness in its survival. And in particular, you have to treat the Old Testament and the New Testament in somewhat separate eyes. First of all, the Old Testament's uniqueness in survival lies in its, in its preservation of the exact letters of the text. The oldest copies of, of the Old Testament that we have are virtually identical to the next oldest and the next oldest and the next oldest. It just the variance among the Old Testament is insanely precise. We've talked about textual criticism some in here. We talked about variance, the idea that when you're copying things by hand, it's easy to miss a letter and, and miss a line. Yeah. Or, yeah, we've done that before. When, right? when you're doing water balls, what you? When you've got water balls, you're telling you. The Old Testament doesn't have that. Yeah. Uh, the 3rd century in Getty scroll that they just, this is the, that scroll, right? It's like finger, finger wide actual size, right? They digitally, this is really cool, this was two or three years ago, they found this charred old scroll at En Gedi, this place <laughs> near the Dead Sea, and they couldn't open it because if they opened it, it would have just disintegrated, right? So they were just holding it and, and, and waiting, and technology caught up, and so they digitally unrolled it, and the, the difference in the, in the ink in the char on the paper was enough that they could actually make out what was written, right? So, third century... 
3rd century AD, it's identical to the Masoretic text. There's not a single variant in, in this, this ancient scroll that was there. And so, I, yeah, I geeked out when I, when I found out about this. It was fun. Um, I think that's fascinating. How did they scroll it? Did they... They did a couple different uh, infrared and MRI kind of scans. Oh. And then yeah. realigned it. Yeah, really cool. Fourth century Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm sure you've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. <coughs> Fourth century BC. Again, the Isaiah Scroll, impeccable. The only changes are changes in, in spelling of words that, that changed over time. Like, you know how like the, Brit the Brits spell color with a U, and the Americans spell it without, without a U? <laughs> well, my phone is set to British, and I haven't changed it back. Okay, but the reason that happened was, was just history advancing, right? America came along and started speaking English differently, and you started spelling words differently. The Isaiah Scroll, found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the only changes, the only variance between that and the Masoretic text of four, four or 500 AD is, is spelling changes, not word changes, not errors in copying. It's ridiculous the amount of preservation of the exact letters of the text we have in the Old Testament. Uh, not to say there isn't any variance, it's just incredible compared to any other ancient document, by far. New Testament, the uniqueness is in its is in the amount of manuscripts we have. Where the Old Testament, we don't have as many manuscripts as we would like from very ancient times. The uh, preciseness of it is impeccable. In the New Testament, the amount of manuscripts we have is ridiculous, and the pre preciseness of it is impressive, but not impeccable. Uh, so again, we've done text criticism in here, so I assume this, this makes a little bit of sense. So, examples of other ancient works, Plato, Aristophanes, Caesar, Aristotle. Uh, date written, so example of Plato, 427 to 347 BC, about. Earliest copy we have, 900 AD. So, what you do then is you say, how, how long in between the time of writing and the earliest copy that we have, that would indicate how reliable it is, right? So, 1,200 years is the, the distance between composition and earliest copy. The track we go. The number of copies we have, seven. I say copies, manuscripts, as in handwritten before, I think it's 1200 is about when they stopped taking, taking uh, manuscripts of these kinds of ancient documents. Aristophanes is similar, 1200, 1000, 1400. The best we have for, for ancient texts in, in the Greek uh, language is Homer's Iliad, by far. Uh, 900. BC was when it, when it was written. Our earliest manuscripts are from about 400 BC. That's a, that's a difference of 500 years. About 643 copies, and the accuracy of the copies isn't how many variants there are within the text. About 95% accurate among the different, different texts. If you count up the variants, count, count up the letters, count up the possible variants within the letters. 95% accurate for the Iliad. New Testament. 100,000. Oh, you want to guess? Did you say so so what have the other seven numbers, accuracy of copies, because they weren't accurate? There's, there's not enough oh, okay. text okay. to, <laughs> okay. to, uh, yeah, to actually calculate. First century AD, earliest copies are from the second century AD, so less than 100 years. We have 5,600 manuscripts, at least. Obviously, those are various lengths. Some are that big. Some are full books. Uh, same is true of all of these, by the way. Some are a couple pages, some are the entire work. 99.5% accuracy among you guys. I've, I've, we've talked through the biggest changes to the Bible. You've got the ending of Mark, and you've got chapter 8 of jo the book of John with the woman who's caught in adultery. Mm -hmm. Those are the two biggest problems with the New Testament text. All of the rest are ridiculously minor. That, again, is insane. It's unheard of as far as Greek manuscript, manuscript evidence for any other work. And, and even uh, Persian histories. Uh, you look at um, Herodotus and uh, other ones I'm blanking on that I've read a lot of, and I can't think of his name right now. But again, they're in this range, not this range. So, as far as external evidence goes, 
the Bible is very unique, particularly in its survival in both the Old and New Testament forms. No other book has this kind of sticking power. Um, you don't have anything specific in here about like historical external evidence. For instance, other authors from that time that have the same people or the same situations or the same stories or whatever. Like Josephus, that's the one I just... Gotcha. Okay. Uh, yeah. So more external evidence would be would be. Uh, actually, I'm about to get to that. Oh, okay. Uh, you good? So, I put this under the common criticisms thing. So, this is. So I want to try as we're going through apologetics. I want to try and give you the practical side. So we we've learned all. I've shown you all the evidence and the facts and figures that sometimes you just gotta go back and review so you have it ready. But when you're engaged in a discussion about these things, and I'm gonna try and give you the common things that come up from the other side and talk through how, how would you address them. One is the Bible's full of miracles. I don't accept the reality of miracles. Well, again, this is where the presuppositional approach helps because they're lying. They, they do accept the reality of miracles. Uh, they just don't know it. They just don't know it. They won't admit it. Uh, there aren't, there's no such thing as an atheist as we were talking about last week. Well, and I, ha I always go to, whether it's right or not, I say, just truth is truth, whether you believe it or not. Yeah. It's subject. No, it's not. Yeah, and it, however, I would say, if you're going to believe in a miracle, the miracles that you want to believe in are the ones that are well attested. Yeah? You got, you got no other miracle that's as well attested as the resurrection of Jesus. Again, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, the most... If any skeptic scholar you ask will say, 1 Corinthians 13 was definitely written by Paul of Tarsus. They will accept that Paul of Tarsus existed and he wrote chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. They don't accept chapters 1 through 14, but 15 is definitely him. And in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, Paul says 400 people bore witness to the resurrected Christ. Historically speaking, when you're, when you're looking at the the methodology for studying history as opposed to studying science. Historically speaking, 400 eyewitnesses is very good historical evidence for the validity of a historical event, if all of the witnesses agree. Uh, so, one example of a miracle, the one that they're probably denying is the resurrection of Christ, since that's the one that the book's all about. Uh, you say, look, from a historical standpoint, um, this is the one to believe, if you're going to believe it. And most people do believe that miracles exist. They won't admit it. But also, sometimes if someone's like, I don't believe in the existence of miracles, personal accounts. I think most people can, can relate to small miracles that they witness. I often tell the story of my brother, who was supposed to be born, still born, born with massive holes in his heart and a shrunken left lung, up to an hour before the delivery. And post-delivery, his lung was fully formed, the holes had shrunk, and he wasn't dead. Uh, surprise. The, I count that as a miracle. I do believe that God still performs miracles. He specifically intervenes. The other thing is, that's the whole point of the Bible. It's telling you about something miraculous. It's telling you about... God, who is by definition miraculous, he does not operate by the normal rules for humans, because he's not human, and he's telling you about how he saves, and saving people is a miraculous thing, saving them from death. So, yeah, it records a whole bunch of miracles, that's kind of the whole point. Uh, the Bible isn't historically accurate, they'll often throw at you. So things like, um, things like, what examples to give? Already a little bit over time, so we'll cut that short. The one that I often hear, I, I don't tend to argue as much anymore about creation. Of, I, it just doesn't interest me as much as it used to. Uh, but they'll say, look, historically, the, the Earth is supposed to be billions of years old, and the Bible says it's only 6,000 years old. And it's like, well, then I explain the difference between history and science. But getting if they know what they're talking about a little bit more, they'll probably bring up something like, uh, Naaman, or Esther, and Xerxes, the fact that the Persian king names in, in the, the periods of the Bible that record history of Persia don't mention kings that, that the Bible mentions. 
And so you have to actually know a little bit, a little bit of your stuff. So for one thing, Ahasuerus is the name of, of the Bible, uh, in, of, uh, of the king of Persia in Esther. Most likely that is a Hebrew or an Aramaic, Aramaicized version of the name Xerxes. The, the king is Xerxes. Vashti is probably an Aramaic version of the name um, Again, and I'm blanking. I've been, this has been happening more and more. I think I actually have something wrong. Forgetting facts that I Maybe usually have. Brain surgery. Yeah. yeah. Alzheimer's. It's actually starting to worry me. <laughs> uh, anyway, there's lots of work that's been done on that. Another example would be um, history. Oh, the, I'll, I'll go on that. They'll, they'll, in conjunction with the, the Bible isn't historically accurate. They'll say, the Bible has little or no ar archaeological support. This is one thing that's thrown at me all the time. First of all, wrong. <laughs> the Bible has a ridiculous amount of archaeological support. What they mean is there are specific points in the Bible that do not have archaeological support. Example of one that came up uh, that changed about 60 years ago. Throughout all of Christian history, there was no extra-biblical attestation or mention of Pilate. He has no Pilate, mm -hmm. proconsul just, of, just of uh, Jerusalem, of Judea, right? from Rome. You would expect that the Romans would have some record of this high government official, and we had no record of any Roman high, gov high government official in Judea named Pilate. Until we found a stone that had Pilate's name written on it, and it said proconsul of Judea. Okay, that argument for that particular fact instantly got destroyed, because you used to say there's no archaeological evidence that Pilate existed. Now there is archaeological evidence that Pilate existed. Instantly destroyed that argument. Similar arguments are made about uh, the walls of Jericho. There's lots of people will say there's no archaeological evidence that, that the walls of Jericho didn't fall. So, well, not yet doesn't mean that it's not there, it just means we haven't found it yet. You can't deny uh, what hasn't happened historically until you have evidence for it. One evidence would be a witness that claims to be an eyewitness who wrote it down. Uh, again, doing history instead of science, when history is what you need to do. They recently found an ossuary for somebody. James. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, James, the brother of Jesus. So they yeah. supposedly found his bone box. Mm -hmm. Again, there was no record of... of outside of the Bible and outside of Christian documents. I'm just like, what do you mean outside of Christian documents? There's still archaeological evidence that's not from the Bible. There are all, all kinds of Christian documents that would reference James, the brother of Jesus, but they weren't reliable because they came from the church. The Christian, yeah, Christian. So we had to find something outside, of, a, and a, yeah, a secular source that mm -hmm. gave right, anyway. So again, that argument just breaks down once you know a little bit, and that's the kind of thing that you kind of got to do your own study. If you're interested in this thing, and usually that, that comes along when somebody presents you with something you don't know, an argument you haven't heard, and you're like, okay, i got to learn my stuff. And you suddenly get a fire lit under you to learn your facts and figures. But advice for whenever you encounter that? And say, look, I don't know what you're, what you're talking about. I have to get back to you. Important thing when you say that, you have to get back to them. Mm -hmm. You have to go do the research, and you follow up. You say, look, I looked into to the archaeological evidence you were suggesting, and actually I found some stuff that, that kind of contradicts the point you were making. Or, look, I haven't found anything, so we're going to have to put this pin in that and keep talking. This is where you can get caught up in doing the wrong kind of apologetics. Remember, what's the point of apologetics? Uh, shame. <laughs> <laughs> well, first, y affirming, yes? Affirming that Jesus, or that, that Christ is... There you go. It, the point of apologetics is preaching the gospel. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's removing any obstacles so that the gospel can be preached. And this is where you can get caught up in the removing the obstacles and not getting caught up in the preaching the gospel. So I want your focus to be, as you're doing apologetics, the point is preaching the gospel, giving a reason for the hope that you have of resurrection, the gospel, so that they might be put to shame. Yes, shame is the point of doing apologetics, but <laughs> kind of remember the lead up to that. Uh, I'll arrest this. <laughs> Last one, you can't use the Bible to prove the Bible. That's circular reasoning. Uh, it's actually not. <laughs> you actually have to do this anytime you're, you're trying to find the validity or the reliability of a particular literary work. You have to ask, what does the literary work say about itself? It's not circular reasoning to look in the Bible to say, see what the Bible says about itself. That's called logic. 
after ascertaining what the Bible says about itself, you can take other steps to, to determine if it's true, which would be the external evidence that we were just looking at. Things that support the claims that the Bible makes about itself. Historical evidence, uh, manuscript evidence, all of this stuff. However, um, I, I would say that the Bible is a starting place, and it is the source of truth about the gospel, which is the point of apologetics. It's the only place where you can get that truth, and so it has to be your starting place. It is the only place to, to get the truth that I'm trying to prove. So if you have your apologetics in line, what am I trying to prove? What am I trying to show? I'm trying to give a reason for the hope, the gospel? And the only source of knowledge of the gospel is this book. It's not circular reasoning to look at this book for the evidence. Just like if you're trying to look for how to make a cake and there's only one cookbook in the world, it's not circular reasoning to look in a cookbook for how to make a cake and then say, look, this cookbook tells you how to make a cake. That's not illogical at all, right? Makes total sense. That's exactly what we're doing when we're looking at the Bible for evidence of the gospel. It's the source. Why wouldn't you look at it? That's the reliability of the Bible. Questions, worries, I'm sorry, I was speeding there at the end because we were pretty close to being done. I didn't want to extend this into two weeks. Oh my goodness, Caleb! <laughs> hey, I, I feel like the, the whole thing. <laughs> oh my goodness. I feel the same way, Caleb. But I didn't want to get up yet. Questions, worries, concerns?